concern about women before they get pregnant, during the pregnancy, excess, excess fat and excess sugar will link to hyperinsulinemia, larger babies, or placental insufficiency if the mother is malnourished, and you get to, into trouble if you then gain fast weight, early adiposity rebound, I'll show you in a minute, early sexual maturation, central obesity. That's what's killing people in developing countries, hypertension, diabetes, the metabolic syndrome, more than the obesity. On the other hand, fetal large babies, fetal microsomia, high BMI, also a problem. This is the data from this cohort through age seven, and we can see that the percent of obesity rose very quickly, and you can see that the figures are coming all the way up to 18, and this is mean BMI. From here, the average BMI now is plus one standard deviation. Stunting, one would say this is very nice. We don't have stunting because height is normal. But look at what happened with BMI. Stunting, height is normal, but weight is excessive. So we have BMI that is elevated starting from birth. At six months, we can separate who's gonna be overweight and obese from the normal, and at three years, we can define who is going to be overweight versus who is going to be obese. So it's too late when you get to school children. This needs to be handled much earlier. And this is the height. On average, we're quite happy, but if you look at this data, it's because we have obese children that are pushing the whole distribution up. So be very mindful of uh, assessing length, but also assessing obesity because this is not healthy growth. Everybody, after about 12 months, independent of birth weight, has moved up. This is what the obesogenic environment does. Length, on average, okay, at the expense of elevated body weight, elevated adiposity. This is the BMI trajectory. We have to act in the first 12 months of life, ideally during pregnancy and pre-pregnancy on the mother but definitely it's too late by the time you reach school age. One aspect I was telling you about is maturation. Maturation, pediatricians measure the bone age. Otherwise, you have to wait until puberty, until the, the, the woman has the menarche, or in the case of, of males, they mature sexually. You can do this with ultrasound now, and I'll show you data, which is quite interesting. This is the x-ray. The x-ray can be assessed with a computer data system, or by looking at and comparing to the Grulich pile standards. Now this can be computerized with ultrasound, no need for radiation, and you can see here the relationship between ultrasound bone age and adiposity, especially in girls. This is before sexual maturation. This is just the effect of adiposity. And this is how the accelerated bone age is telling you that the child, although he is five years, he may be six or seven in terms of his bones. So he's taller, but he'll stop growing. And that's what obesity fools you. You can see here, if you do the x-ray or the bone expert computerized system versus the ultrasound, you have a much better view of the effect of obesity as a continuous effect on obesity uh, in, the, in the case, uh, obese, overweight, and normal are the three columns for each of the three methods. So this is a good method that can be used at the field. The other thing that you can do, and this is how many of you plot BMIs? If you don't measure height, you cannot plot BMIs. But if you plot BMIs, you will see by Dr. Roland Cachera from France has described this adiposity rebound. And what it we're showing here from our cohort is how early they are maturing. Most, the adiposity rebound is supposed to be six years and later. We have about half of the children that have matured before that age. And the ones that have matured earlier, you can see the, the, the curves, the ones that are of normal, of normal BMI, the green, in fact, hasn't yet, about half of them only have uh, done the adiposity rebound. But the ones that actually did the rebound by age two, the majority of them are obese. The ones that had a BMI that was between one and two are doing a little bit better. So the adiposity rebound is something that we can all monitor if you plot BMI. If you don't plot BMI, you don't, you're not able to see this rebound. 
So this is something that we should be following at a population. We do not know yet exactly how to modulate, but just like with menarche that used to be at 17 years and is now at 12, this is potentially movable if you have less adiposity. This is the adiposity of this child, of these children by the adiposity rebound. The ones under three, 69% have excess adiposity based on the uh, bioelectrical impedance assessment of fat mass. There are better methods, and we'll hear about those in a few minutes. So you can see that depending on the age of adiposity rebound, you will have less adiposity. Less adiposity also means slowing down this, uh, this maturation, the early menarche, girls getting pregnant at age 12 in schools, and all of that that's going on at the present time. The metabolic status, if we look at glucose, if we look at insulin, triglyceride level, waist circumference, and HDL, and build a C-score of the five, we find that it's directly related to the adiposity rebound and to the adiposity. So if you have the adiposity under three, 64% are in the top quartile of abnormal metabolic score. If, on the other hand, you get your adiposity rebound after seven, only 16% have it. So we are actually can be acting in preventing the metabolic consequence of adiposity early on. Skeletal maturation, which is what I was telling you, again, very much linked to adiposity. This could be cause or effect. Telarc, by age seven, girls already have breasts. Stage two tanner, not beyond that. And again, very much linked to the adiposity rebound and to the adiposity. Why is this important? The only thing a woman can do to prevent breast cancer is to have a late menarche, to have an early pregnancy, and to breastfeed. One of the factors then is maturation to prevent breast cancer. There's nothing else you can do to prevent breast cancer. So, and also not be obese. But this is why this is important. The whole genome is, a gene is being patterned epigenetic changes are linked to the, to the period of puberty. And precisely that is the time when you have, you're setting up yourself for the risk of breast cancer. These are a whole lot of effects of nutrients on epigenetics. So we're not only our genes, but diet has a direct effect on the genes in the expression pattern that will affect life course risks. What is healthy growth? Growth standards reflect nutrition and feeding practices. We need long-term data. The NCHS data that WHO and we all use for a long time is associated to obesity rates of 40 to 50%, to diabetes rates of 50% in the population it originated. Those people are now 70 years of age. And they've had a large burden of disease. So growth needs to be examined over long-term. This is women around the world. In 2005, this is 2015, the projected numbers of overweight and obesity in women are rising. Linked to that is the rise in diabetes rate. We're already seeing it in Mexico, in India, in South Asia, in the Middle East too. The, the, the budget of, this, of some of the Gulf countries that goes to insulin, the health budget, about 15% of the whole health budget is to buy insulin. Obesity in women in the Middle East, especially in the Gulf countries, is over 50%. And there's something that needs to be done to rescue those women from whatever is going on that defines those very high rates of obesity, the highest in the world. So going back to my original, we not only need people to survive, we need to bring down disability from our cardiac infarct, from stroke, from cancer. High obesity needs to be pushed back. The task is not only survival, but healthy survival. It starts with healthy growth. Timing for that, preconceptional, during gestation. By the time, this is why the thousand days, very early, critical nutrients, diabetes needs to be under control. Otherwise, you're losing it. At every stage of the life course, fetal life, infancy, adolescent, adult life, so this is the new paradigm for nutrition. Nutrition throughout the life course, every nutrient matters. Healthy diets, food base. Food base, fortification is part of food base. 
healthy foods. So we have the genes, we have the environment, short, we've seen some of this, long term. But if we're going to talk to the politicians, we need to put school failure, poor education, lower income, infections, stunting, lower income, diabetes, obesity, cancer, stroke, coronary heart disease, aging related function loss, and put a cost to that. Very briefly, this is my last set of slides. This is Latin America. We have the Economic Commission for Latin America, and you can actually go, it's in English. They actually have measured the cost of hunger only on the undernutrition side. And they've actually looked at what we've been discussing, undernutrition has effects on productivity, effects on mortality. We are concerned with mortality, with morbidity, with mental development, but the key player here is in red, productivity. I'll show you data on that in a minute. So it's not only an ethical, it is also social and economic issue. It's not that we want to do good. If we are going to develop as nations, we need to have healthy growth in the children. We need to have economic impact so that we can talk versus building a bridge. What is more important, feeding children or building a bridge? We have to be able to give the answer to that. And you can do it two ways. This is looking at the cost you're paying now because of children who are undernourished, because of the educational cost, and because of the adults that have lost productivity. But also, you can say, what's going to happen in the next 50 years with what we're losing today? That is the perspective. So the economists that worked with us on this did it both ways. So this is the incidental cost in health, in education, and in productivity. But now let's look at it over the life course. Let's look at it over 60 years. And we have a much better argument because what we fail to do now is going to have a long-term effect. If we look at it from the standpoint of the countries of Latin America that were affected and were studied, this is 17 billion. 17 billion is being lost because of this issue. And in the blue and in the light green, you have what we would normally measure by looking at health and education. But look at the yellow and the purple. The problem is much bigger if we look at lifetime productivity. So the economic costs need to be seen, whatever is going to be the impact across the lifespan. This is my last slide. This is the Nobel Prize. Not my Nobel Prize, but this is Robert Fogel.